First, I would like to thank the organizers, especially Dr. Yi Xin, for inviting me to speak at this conference. Today, I'm going to talk about a topic, statistical rigor in genomics data analysis. Uh, statistical rigor is frequently mentioned in the statistics field, but not so much in genomics. Then what is statistical rigor? It's actually about the performance guarantee of statistical methods. So here I'm going to use three examples to explain what I mean by performance guarantee. P-values are frequently used, and valid p-values need to be uniformly distributed between 0 and 1 under the null hypothesis. For confidence interval, say a 95% confidence interval, we actually want its coverage probability for covering the true parameter greater than the 95%. For the false discovery rate, short as FDR, we actually expect that the average proportion of false discoveries among our discoveries should be under the claim level, say 5%. In genomics, these three criteria are often used, but their performance guarantee were rarely checked. Why is that? I think there are two reasons. The first reason is that genomics data types are new and complex, so we cannot directly apply classical or textbook statistical methods to these new data directly. And the second reason, I think, is the fast-moving field, because we have to really develop methods in a fast manner to catch the speed. So that leaves us very little room and time to think about the rigor of our statistical method. Today, I'm going to talk about three common causes of invalid p-values I have seen in the field. The first cause is very interesting. It's about the misformulation of a two-sample test as a one-sample test. So I'm going to use the CHIP-seq data analysis p-calling as an example. Here in this illustration, we can see that we have divided the genome into bins. In this red bin, we would have a count in the background sample, the negative control, a count in the experimental sample from the condition of our interest. And what we want to do is to compare the two counts. If the experimental count is larger, much larger than the background count. We want to call this region a peak, a potential protein binding site. So in two popular softwares, Max and Homer, their statistical formulation can be simplified as this. Although I have to acknowledge that what they did in reality is a lot more complicated, but this simplification, simplification will capture the statistical essence in their method. So let's say I look at that red region, and for the background count and experimental count, I use two uppercase notations to denote the random variable that we have in mind when we do statistics. And I have the corresponding lowercase notations, small x and small y, for the random observations we actually have in our data. So data is what we have at hand, but the random variables are what we have in our mind. So in their approach, the p-value calculation is essentially this probability. The probability that y is greater or equal than the observed small y, under the assumption that the big y follows a Poisson distribution with parameter mean parameter x. Is this p-value calculation correct? Actually, if we think about the statistical test behind this calculation, we would doubt this, this calculation. Why is that? The reason is that here we are considering y to follow a Poisson distribution with a parameter lambda. And we are trying to test this null hypothesis that lambda equals the observed x. And x is from the background condition. And the alternative hypothesis is that lambda is greater than x. So that will give us this one-sided p-value. However, you can see clearly from this formulation that the lowercase x was treated as a fixed parameter, and we have ignored its randomness. 
So in other words, we are doing a one sample test by treating only the experimental data as a sample. And we have ignored the fact that the background count is also a random observation. But the question that leaves for us is that realizing the problem with this p-value calculation, what's the correct approach? How can we do a two-sample test when the sample size is only one under each condition? Our textbook doesn't teach us this. So clearly here the p-value calculation is difficult. However, after a second thought, we can see that we would have a one p-value for each region, and we will pull those p-values together. And the ultimate goal is to set a cutoff on the p-values to control the FDR. Therefore, p-values are just intermediates for FDR control, and we do not care about the p-values per se. So can we have another approach to avoid the need for p-value calculation while still achieving FDR control? So motivated by this, my students and I developed this method called Clipper. So it is a framework for achieving FDR control in high throughput data analysis from two conditions. And the advantage of Clipper is that it no longer requires p-values. And our work has been accepted by the journal Genome Biology. So to highlight the advantages of Clipper, it does not require high-resolution p-values. It does not assume parametric distributions as most methods do. So I will talk about this issue in my second course. And the third is that Clipper does not require many replicates, making it a very flexible framework. So what does Clipper require then? It has two components. One is contrast scores, one per feature. The second is a cutoff on the contrast scores. So coming back here on the right, we see that suppose we have D features and the sample sizes we have under the two conditions are M and M. And we have an FDR threshold Q, say 5%. So Clipper need a way to contract, construct contrast scores, say, C1 to C CD. And then the theoretical assumption Clipper requires that the way for a contrast score construction satisfy that the contrast scores of those features from the null, we call them uninteresting features, should be symmetric around zero. While the contrast scores for the interesting features we want to discover should be largely positive on the right tail. And then Clipper leverages a theory for setting a cutoff on the contrast score so the FDR can be controlled. And we can call the features whose contrast scores lie on the right of the threshold, the cutoff, as our discoveries. So the name Clipper was motivated by the famous NBA team, LA Clippers, because we are based in LA. And in our work, we have applied Clipper to four real applications, chip seek data analysis, the peak calling, mass spectrometry analysis for identifying peptides, and bulk and single cell RNA-seq data for differential gene expression analysis, and high C data for identifying differential interacting region pairs. So we showed in our work that with Clipper as an add-on to the two famous software, Max2 and Homer, so we can actually help these two methods reduce the false discovery rate below the target. So you can see that these two curves on the left were their false discovery rates before applying Clipper as an add-on. With Clipper as an add-on, the false discovery rates drop below the targets. And also we can see that Clipper maintains very good power. Interestingly, it even improves the power of Homer when the target FDR is greater than 5%. The second common cause of invalid p-values is the misspecification of a parametric model that does not fit data well. So here I'm going to use the example about differential, differential expression analysis from bulk RNA-seq data. So this is a data set from immunotherapy patients from the cell paper, and two popular methods, DE-seq2 and HR, were applied to the data. And we, we can see from the QQ plot that 
for the two conditions, pre-therapy patients and on-therapy patients, the negative binomial models assumed by each method do not fit the data very well. Because if they do, we should expect the dots here, the dots should lie on the diagonal line, the straight line. But that's not the case indicating that here the negative binomial model, the parametric model, is not a good fit. And I have to say that here in each condition we have about 50 patients, so that will give us enough sample size for evaluating model fitness. So furthermore, on this data set, we observe a very weird phenomenon. That is here the red dots are the number of DE genes we found from by each method from the real data set. And we conducted the permutation analysis I mentioned in the beginning to shuffle the samples between two conditions. So we know from those permuted data, there should be no true DE genes. However, applying each method to the permuted data to obtain the distribution indicated by the bar and the error bar, we can see that DE-Seq2 and HR in a lot of permuted data sets have identified even more DEGs than they do in the real data. This is definitely something unsatisfactory. And on the right-hand side, we can see that if the distribution of the proportion of permuted data sets where a gene is mistakenly identified as a DEG. We can see that DEC2 and HR have this proportion very large. So that means a lot of genes were frequently identified as DEG from many, many permuted data sets by mistake. And we also compare with other popular methods like LimaView. NOIC is a non-parametric method used by the GTEC consortium. And DRSeq is the newest non-parametric method that claim to address the FDR control issue of DSeq2 and HR. And finally, the classical Wilcoxon rank sum test. Interestingly, in this data set and other data sets we compared, we have seen that Wilcoxon, the most classical method, actually had the, had the best performance. So this echoes a very interesting message. That is, when our sample size are actually large enough, we don't necessarily need to use a parametric model at the risk that the model might not fit the data well. Instead, we can leverage those classical non-parametric methods to achieve very good performance. And this is our summary of this analysis I just mentioned. So it actually echoes this importance of using an appropriate method based on the sample size and the sample property, not just based on the popularity of the method itself. So this is a collaboration with Dr. Yu Mei Li from Dr. Wei Li's lab at UC Irvine. So we found out this issue and we did analysis and found the advantage of the Wilcoxon test. The third common cause of invalid p-values is the mistreatment of inferred covariates as, as observed. Here, I'm going to use the identification of differentially expressed genes along cell pseudotime from single cell rna seq data as an example. So what is a pseudotime? In the single cell field, pseudotime indicates a latent temporal variable that reflects a cell's relative transcriptome status among all cells. So to obtain the pseudotime, the computational or statistical task is called pseudotime inference, also known as trajectory inference. So the goal is to estimate the pseudotime of a cell based on all cells gene expression data. So popular methods for pseudotime inference include Monaco 3, T-scan, and slingshot. So you can see in this illustration down here, we will try to infer the trajectory as the black lines and then project cells to the closest trajectory to obtain the pseudotime. So then, what is the downstream analysis after pseudotime inference? That is, we often want to identify the genes whose expression change changes along the pseudotime. Like here on the left-hand side, the CCL5 looks like a DE gene, while the EEDE gene on the right doesn't look like a DE gene. But the pseudotime um, DE gene identification needs to consider an important fact 
That is, the sales schedule time is not an observed covariate of sale. Instead, it is inferred from the same data we are going to do the DE inference. So on the right hand side, we can see that for the sales along the trajectory, if we perform subsampling of sales and then redo the schedule time inference in each cell in the subsample, we will see that for each cell, which is a row here, it has a distribution of schedule time across the subsamples. This clearly shows that sales schedule time is not a fixed covariate, but a random variable. So before we started working on this, existing methods I put in the red box here didn't consider sales pseudo time as a random variable. Instead, they treated pseudo time as an observed covariate. So with this, we can see that the QQ plots do not look right under the null hypothesis because if they're right, they should follow um, the straight line. And also the histogram show that except for Monaco 3, the other three methods have p-value distributions under the null, clearly far away from the uniform distribution. So motivated by this, we develop a method called pseudo time DE. And the advantage of pseudo time DE is that we perform subsampling to capture the pseudo time inference, and therefore we can derive a correct null distribution of the test statistic that considers the pseudo time inference uncertainty. So we can generate valid p values. And another advantage of pseudo time DE is that it uses the generalized additive model to gain good power. So we have to know that although Monaco 3 had good p-value distribution, but it uses the more restrictive generalized linear model, so its power is not as large as the generalized additive model. So our work was published in Genome Biology earlier this year. So finally, to summarize, I talk about three common causes of invalid p-values in genomics data analysis. The misformulation of a two-sample test as a one-sample test. Second, the misspecification of a parametric model that does not fit it well. Third, the mistreatment of inferred covariates as observed. So our proposals responding to the three common causes are, we propose a framework called Clipper to achieve p-value free FDR control. And we echo the importance of classical non-parametric method as the baseline for our method development. So when the sample sizes are large, I think we should call this a uh, renaissance because we can use those methods and regain their advantages again. And for a third one, we propose the pseudo time DE as a method that identifies differential express genes along cell pseudo time by considering pseudo time as the inferred covariate and captures its uncertainty. So finally, I want to bring our attention to this paper I wrote last year. So it's about the distinction between hypothesis testing and binary classification, two popular tools that can be easily confused. Finally, I want to thank my two PhD students and who are now doctors who graduated recently, Xinjo and Yiling, for their contribution to this Clipper work. And Xinjo also contributed to the large sample DE analysis together with Dr. Yu Mei Li in Dr. Wei Li's lab at UC Irvine. And also my PhD student Dong Yuan Song for developing the studio time DE method. I want to also thank my funding agencies. Thank you. <laughs>